Hi, in this video, we're going to look at ocean currents and we're going to see what drives them, where they go, what the big patterns are, and also how do they affect real people and how do we know they're there? How do we actually monitor them and measure them? In the big picture, ocean currents are part of uh, natural cycles that work along with the global winds to move heat energy around the world. They're great transfers of heat. They specifically take heat from the tropics and they move that heat away from the tropics toward the rest of the world, toward, toward polar regions. And uh, the global winds and the global ocean currents work together in the sense that the winds drag the ocean currents along from above, but the ocean currents affect the winds by warming them or cooling them from below. So they have that mutual relationship with each other. An ocean current is a long distance, continuous global movement of water that's significantly warmer or cooler than the surrounding water, the rest of the water in the ocean. So one way to think of that is that ocean currents are sort of like a river within the ocean that's warmer or cooler, a cooler river or a warmer river within the larger pool of water within the ocean. Overall, to make one of these circulations from the tropics down here, for example, all the way up to the polar regions and back takes about 500 years. So these are very slow compared to the winds uh, that drag them. What determines the direction of these ocean currents? It's actually three things working together. On the one hand, you have the simple ocean basins themselves, the bowl shapes between the continents the, that the ocean currents have to sit in, and they can only move in that space. So uh, it's a bowl, it's a tray. Um, another analogy might be if uh, you had a puzzle, you know, one of those wooden puzzles, which is a thick board and it has puzzle pieces with handles, you can pull the pieces out. If you were to pour a glass of water into the empty space in that puzzle, then uh, that water would only be able to travel within the bowl shapes left behind by the empty spaces in the puzzle. It's sort of like that. The ocean basins are sort of like a, a wooden puzzle with the pieces pulled out, right? They um, contain the water that's in the currents, okay? So it's interesting that ocean currents are different from winds in the sense that the winds are able to blow uh, for example, the trade winds here are able to blow from east to west and go right over the continents. But the uh, ocean currents cannot, right? They're bound or limited by the boundaries of the continents, similar to the boundaries between uh, differences between fish and birds. The second factor that determines the direction of ocean currents is the convection loops, which are simply the heat driven cycles, right? Where the uh, water that warms up around the equator, it expands, it wants to move away, wants to get move out because it's gotten warmer and it moves out towards the poles. And when it gets to the polar regions, it's obviously losing heat along the way by using it for motion. Plus the polar regions are also naturally colder because they get much less sunlight. Um, plus there's ice up there that's falling into the oceans and chilling them. So all that combination uh, makes it cool off. And then the current comes back uh, on the other side, cooled, right? So you have warm water current moving away from the tropics and you have cold currents coming back. And if you look around the map, that's the general pattern, right? That, that's what makes this a lot easier. You just look and say, okay, yeah, the arrow is moving away from the tropics, they're warm. The arrow is coming back to the tropics, they're cold. You may wonder, by the way, um, what's about, what about this exception over here, right? There's some exceptions where it's all warm currents. Well, that basically, the water doesn't get far enough outside the tropics to be cooled off, right? The, because Asia's there, right? So um, it gets stuck in these loops in the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal here. And so uh, it's just going to stay warm because that's tropical too, just like where it came from. The third factor besides the shapes of the continents and the convection loops that makes the uh, ocean currents go in the direction they do 
is the force that's given to them by the global winds that are dragging over them from above. Let's take a look at that. Um, the winds uh, are able to drag the oceans because the oceans have tiny little capillary waves that are created by the surface tension on the top of the ocean, sort of like treads on a basketball. And for every approximately 60 miles an hour that the wind blows, uh, the ocean will be dragged about three miles an hour. So it's only about 5% of the speed. Okay? It's not as if the ocean's flying along at the, at the same speed that the wind is, but that's still a lot. That's still a lot, okay? So that propels the ocean and gives it force uh, in these ocean currents over a long distance. And if you know your global winds, you will know that, for example, let's just watch from Spain here, uh, the trade winds, which is the biggest winds in the world, the trade winds flow right exactly in the same trajectory that uh, these currents that we see on this map do. They're the winds that blew Christopher Columbus to the New World. And sure enough, uh, the trade winds follow right over the Canary Current and then the North Equatorial Current right towards Dominican Republic where Christopher Columbus landed, you know. Um, and uh, the other major winds in the mid-latitudes are the westerlies, and they blow right over where the Gulf Stream is and the North Atlantic Drift out this way. Okay, so this part of this loop is trade winds, and coming back this way is the westerlies, and this dragon right on top of it, approximately 5% uh, of the speed of the winds above. Let's take a close look at that. The Gulf Stream uh, is warm water up the coast of the United States, coming from just above the Caribbean islands here. And it runs from Florida up the US coast and becomes the North Atlantic Drift, goes all the way to Europe. This is very famous because it gives Europeans a temperatures in Northwest Europe that are significantly lower, uh, excuse me, higher than you might think. In other words, um, the temperatures in London or Ireland are higher than they would be over here in North America, which is not receiving that warm water offshore. Just look at the map. I mean, London is a major city, but it's up here in the northern, northern regions of Canada where it's super cold and hardly anybody lives up there. You know, um, Just to give another example, the city of uh, Marseille in France you know, or La Coruña in, in Spain, on the coast of Spain. Those are, you know, balmy, nice places to be, but uh, they're actually a similar latitude or in some cases higher than Boston. You know, Boston's not known as, it's a nice city, but it's not known for being balmy. <laughs> so um, thanks to the Gulf Stream and then the North Atlantic Drift, Northwest Europe has significantly warmer temperatures. Um, you can even see that on this thermal map here. And you can see the warmer water coming from the uh, U.S. side of the Atlantic and crossing over the Atlantic to Northwestern Europe. And just to be clear, I'm not saying that the countries over there like Ireland and, and uh, France have the same weather as Florida where this Gulf Stream water starts. I'm simply saying that the, the warm water from the coast of Florida ends up there. But um, that doesn't mean that the entire weather systems up there are, are similar to Florida, because obviously the most important factor in the weather in the climate is how much sunlight you get. And they're being so high in latitude, they're obviously going to have a lot less uh, sunlight coming in. All right, so let's look at another example of these currents and how they affect people. On the west coast of the United States, you have a California current, which runs not up the shore like the Gulf Stream on the East Coast, but down the shore. Uh, it's actually coming out of the Kurishio Current from Japan, it, which is warm. It comes across the Pacific and comes down the California Current. And that cools off California in the summertime. And then the onshore winds make it chilly. It can get down into the 40s at night sometimes, even uh, when, it's, when it's warm during the day. So. Um, that's a great bonus for California. It keeps us from overheating, from getting too hot. If you live in the East Coast of the United States, you know, we don't, we don't have that. The East Coast is, becomes very hot often. Uh, the West Coast is very lucky in that regard. 
The overall pattern within ocean currents is that there are five gyres or circular loops in the world that are created by these ocean gyres. And uh, they're called the subtropical gyres and they're centered approximately on 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And the reason for that is because that's where the subtropical highs within the wind system uh, come down straight out of the sky and then they hit the, hit the ocean or the ground and they spray out the winds in all directions. And so um, the westerlies come out of there this way and the tropical uh, trade winds come out this way and drag those currents along. But um, the subtropical gyres are basically these loops. See this loop here? This loop here, they're the North Pacific gyre, the South Pacific gyre, the North Atlantic gyre, the South Atlantic gyre, the Indian Ocean gyre, okay? Five major loops. Each of the loops is constructed out of multiple currents. So for example, the South Atlantic gyre includes the Brazil current, the Benguela current, the South Equatorial current, uh, and parts of the, um, it, it sort of bottoms out here in the West and East wind drift. So um, those are the five major circular patterns, the gyres around the world. At the center of those gyres, it's calm, similar to the center of a hurricane and uh it's not spiraling it's just staying in place and one of the problems that's associated with that is that there's a gigantic patch of garbage out here that in the north pacific gyre there's this huge garbage patch called the great pacific garbage patch i think it's now split into two but that's something interesting to look up if you're interested in environmental issues it's all this garbage floating out in the middle which um it doesn't really belong to any country, so we need international cooperation to uh, figure out how to clean that up. If you're wondering about the bottom down here, this is not a gyre at the very bottom where it's all cold there. Um, that is just known as the, it says here, west wind and east wind drift, but that circular um, current that runs around the bottom of the world like that is known as the circumpolar current. And the circumpolar current is uh, where it becomes significantly uh, colder than the rest of the world, and it leads into the Southern Ocean. So um, the, Southern, the Southern Ocean is, is, like I said, is designated by, by being uh, not just at the bottom of the world, but where the ocean becomes much colder. That is what the Southern Ocean is. And um, whales, for example, uh, some whales, uh, breed on the coast of Argentina, and then they have to cross over the circumpolar current to get down to Antarctic waters where they feed on krill. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, whale migrations that are associated with that circumpolar current. But it is not considered a gyre. Um, it is just, it's just considered a, a current that moves in a giant uh, circle around the bottom of the world. The ocean currents are responsible for the phenomenon known as El Nino, and the word El Nino means uh, the child in Spanish and it's capital El Nino, which means Jesus, uh, because it's a weather phenomenon that takes place around Christmas time uh, on some years uh, occasionally. And so they call it El Nino because it's when the child Jesus was born. So um, El Nino is used for both the storms associated with the with the weather phenomenon and the climate, but it's also used for the root cause of it as well, the El Nino event. And that root cause is uh, changes in the ocean currents. Okay, so if we look at the map on the top, it's showing us what normally happens in a non-El Nino year. Um, El Nino, uh, events take place every so often, every, it's not, it's not like clockwork. It's not exactly the same amount of time between each one, but every, you know, four or five, six years, something like that, it's unpredictable. Um, and what normally happens in a non El Nino year is that if you remember from our map up here, uh, we said that ocean currents like the winds are like hands that transfer and move heat away. Right. And so away from the tropics, in this case, if you look at the map, um, this Southern Pacific gyre, this part of it, the South Equatorial current dragged by the trade winds is dragging heat away from Latin America. 
Okay, it's dragging heat away from Latin America. And what that's going to do is that it's going to reduce the amount of storms and rain and floods that you, that you have in Latin America. And that's good. It's a heat escape valve, so to speak. So you can even see they drew the heat in this picture. All this red stuff up here is heat, is warmth. It's being pushed out towards Southeast Asia and Australia. And you can see the blue arrow up top is the trade winds that are dragging that along, dragging the, the current above, the current below along. Okay, so it's the combination of the things that we mentioned, the two hands, the winds, and also the ocean currents uh, up there, the red arrow and the blue arrow that are causing that heat to move away from Latin America. Now, what happens during an El Nino year? On the bottom, for reasons that are not fully understood, um, these trade winds become weaker every so often, every four, five, six years. During an El Nino year, the trade winds become weaker and that uh, causes the uh, currents below them to also become weaker to the point where they go backwards, right? There's not, there's not as much pulling them out into the ocean. And so uh, the currents go backwards, you see here, towards Latin America and you can see in the picture here, instead of going out to sea and taking the heat out with it, um, the ocean current gets backed up and heads back towards Latin America. So you have all this heat getting backed up and, and piling up there all along the coast of Latin America, carrying a big buildup of heat over the water, which is causing lots of evaporation. And then that's going to lead to these big storms, which then cause flooding, often mudslides. So if you type in El Nino and Google images and stuff, you see a lot of people, you know, in floods and disasters and stuff like that. And it's, it's because of all this heat that's backed up off of their coastline because of these weaker trade winds, which create the reversed ocean currents there. Okay, so the combination of a change in trade winds, uh, velocity and a change in the ocean currents that results from that by backing up is what's at the root of El Nino. One thing we haven't talked about really is the idea of thermohaline circulation. And the reason we haven't talked about it is because this video focuses mostly on surface currents. Okay, so in other words, if you look at this map here, everything we've talked about on here uh, is a surface current at the, at the surface of the ocean. But there's this other level of the ocean below called the subsurface currents. And we're not gonna get into it too deep, but just to let you know, in the last several decades, there's been a lot of advancement in understanding what they call the global conveyor belt, which is like um, they've tracked water all the way as it goes out to the poles, but then it dives down underneath and sinks at the poles. See, the, the warm water moves out away from the tropics to the poles. It sinks because it's A, colder, and B, um, saltier on the bottom, and the salty water is heavier. So basically the water making a return trip back to the tropics underneath on this conveyor belt in the picture is both colder and also saltier. Okay, so haline means salt driven or salty. And so uh, thermo means heat driven. So it's just the idea of the combination of heat and salt salinity or saltiness that differentiates the uh, warm, less salty water moving out and then the colder, saltier water moving on the bottom coming back. And they've traced this all around the world and they believe that it can take a thousand years for water to travel in this entire global loop around the entire uh, conveyor belt in the world. So that's a relatively new understanding in science. If you've wondered, how do they know this? How do they know that the ocean currents are this temperature or that temperature, warm and cold and where they are? Um, it's because they actually can measure the temperatures with thermometers uh, because they put these ocean buoys and floats out there that measure te temperature, salinity, and the current direction and the current speed, the velocity. Um, and it's a combination of many countries working together, teaming up uh, to create what's called the Argo system. And you can see these buoys um, that contain all those devices, the thermometers, et cetera. And different countries are responsible for different buoys. And you see there's over 3,600 of these things floating around in the oceans of the world. So the green ones are all from the US. 
um, these middle green ones here, these red ones are from Canada. These uh, light blue ones are from North Korea, uh, South Korea. Um, uh, the, purple, the magenta ones are from India and these uh, pink ones with the black dots in them around Australia. You see, so you can see that um, many countries are contributing to this, um, the Argo system, and they all share the data. The way that they measure it is each of the buoys typically is parked about a kilometer below the surface. And then every 10 days, it goes on a cycle of measuring at that depth at one kilometer. It measures all those things, temperature, salinity, currents, and then it goes down and drops down to two kilometers below, measures the same stuff, and then rises up to the surface, measures again. And then it's got the three measurements, surface, one kilometer below, two kilometers below. And then it sends that information out to, uh, to a satellite, which then bounces it to the labs around the world. And so all of these buoys that we see in this map are all doing that. They're all sending information from all over the world. So it makes it um, this giant pool of data that um, they can use about ocean temperature, salinity, and currents. So we really do know what's happening with these. One of the interesting things about this map is that um, many countries are interested in what's happening around Greenland because Greenland has the world's largest ice sheet other than the poles. And it's used as a uh, marker for global warming because uh, the polar waters are warming up at twice the speed of the rest of the world. So if you want to see global warming, you can see it happening faster, twice as fast up there. And so if you notice on this Argo system map, um, there's a lot more different colored dots around Greenland here because many, many countries are interested in monitoring Greenland's water. You know? So you can see that ocean currents play a major role in people's lives. They're really important for understanding um, the climate and also for understanding global warming. And one interesting thing to do uh, is to just pick any current off of this map, pick the, you know, the uh, Somali current or Kuroshio current, and just kind of look it up and see how does that affect people? And it's really amazing. Each one of these currents has its own sort of story about how it affects people in that part of the world. And that's a good sort of entry point into learning about a particular region of the world through the current and its effects on that region of the world. Okay, good luck.